Let's see how to construct the Bell states from the 2-qubit computational basis states. In this video, we're going to examine a quantum circuit, which consists of the Hadamard gate and the controlled NOT gate. This is a visual depiction of the quantum circuit of interest. We're going to examine a 2-qubit system. The qubits are labeled as qubit 1 and qubit 2. By convention, we're going to look at this diagram from left to right. Let's imagine that we initialize qubit 1 and qubit 2 in some particular initial states. We're going to track these two qubits as they traverse the quantum circuit. What are they going to encounter on their journey? First, qubit 1 will encounter the Hadamard gate. Qubit 2 will not encounter any gate over here. That's equivalent to encountering the identity gate, because when the identity operator acts on a qubit state, it doesn't do anything. The qubit state remains unchanged. So we have a single qubit gate over here and a single qubit identity gate over here. So the two qubits are not interacting uh, at this stage. They only start interacting with this controlled NOT gate. So both qubit 1 and qubit 2 encounter the controlled NOT gate. But qubit 1 has already been acted on by the Hadamard gate. And qubit 1 acts as the control in the controlled NOT gate. Qubit 2 acts as the target qubit. Let's translate this diagram into an expression. So we can define u to be the unitary operator associated with this quantum circuit. First, we have to apply the Hadamard tensor product with the identity. So this Hadamard operator is acting on qubit 1, and this identity is acting on qubit 2. The order in which we combine these two operators with the tensor product tells us which subspace they act on. So we have the qubit 1 subspace and the qubit 2 subspace. Qubit 1, it lives in a Hilbert space. It is a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And qubit 2 also lives in a two-dimensional Hilbert space. We can combine these two separate two-dimensional Hilbert spaces into one big four-dimensional Hilbert space. And that four-dimensional Hilbert space describes the two-qubit system. We can construct orthonormal basis sets to describe any state in this four-dimensional Hilbert space. And one very convenient orthonormal basis set is the two-qubit computational basis. All the matrix representations in this video are written in the two-qubit computational basis. So this is what we're dealing with. This is the first operator that we need to apply. We're constructing a two-qubit operator out of a single-qubit operator and another single-qubit operator. This H and this I both have matrix representations that are two by two matrices. So if we take a 2x2 two two matrix and tensor product with another 2x2 two two matrix, we're going to construct a 4x4 four four matrix. So that's what the matrix representation of this is going to look like. So this is the quantum circuit up to this point. Then we have to apply the controlled NOT gate. And this is specifically the controlled NOT gate where uh, the control is qubit 1 and the target is qubit 2. So I'm using this a uh, very explicit notation, C1, X2. Why is this X over here? Well, it's because the X, the Pauli X operator, is analogous to the classical uh, Boolean NOT gate. So the NOT gate from Boolean algebra has a quantum analog, and that is the Pauli X operator. The Pauli X operator is a single qubit operator. When Pauli X acts on a qubit state, it has the effect of swapping the zero and the one. So that computational basis gets swapped around. That's why the Pauli X is also known as a bit flip. If you apply two bit flips in succession, you're actually going to undo the action of the first bit flip. So Pauli X is its own inverse. If you take a bit flip and then you do another bit flip, you'll have no bit flip. It'll be back to exactly where you started. So it's equivalent to the identity. X squared is the identity operator. So X is a single qubit operator but we're actually dealing with the controlled X gate, or the controlled NOT gate, and that is a two-qubit operator, which takes in a control qubit and a target qubit. 
So the target qubit, which is qubit 2 in this case, uh, will get acted on depending on the state of the control qubit, which is qubit 1. So whatever state we have up here in the control qubit is going to influence the action of this operator. So that's very important because that's going to allow us to make these two qubits interact with, with, with each other. So we have to apply this in succession. First, we apply the Hadamard operator on qubit 1, and then we apply the control dot. And it's very important which one we designate uh, to be the control qubit and which one we designate to be the target qubit. If we were to swap this around, we would have a completely different quantum circuit. So we're dealing with this specific quantum circuit, and that's why I've put these indices as 1, 2 over here. Uh, one thing you might notice is that the order of these operators is opposite to what they appear, uh, to how they appear in this diagram. So this H tensor product I is appearing on the right, yet in the diagram it appears on the left. That is because by convention, we're reading this diagram from left to right. And also by convention, when we apply operators to states, if we imagine a state over here, we first apply the operator on the right, and then we apply the operator that's on the left. Alternatively, we could use the associative property of matrix multiplication, and we could take the matrix representations of these two operators and combine them into a single uh, four by four matrix. So we have four by four matrix times four by four matrix. That's going to give us another four by four matrix, which is the matrix representation of U. And then we can take that U and we can act on states. So that is what we're going to do. One more thing that we need to see in this diagram is that if we take U and we apply the Hermitian adjoint, that's the same as U dagger. And U dagger has the effect of swapping these two terms around. In general, taking the Hermitian adjoint of a product of operators also includes taking the Hermitian adjoint of the individual operators, as well as swapping the order. So we have swapped the order, and we've also taken the Hermitian adjoint. But because these operators are Hermitian, taking the Hermitian adjoint has no effect. So this Hadamard gate is Hermitian, the identity is Hermitian, and the control knot is also Hermitian. That is why this dagger doesn't have any other effect besides the effect of swapping the two operators in this product. And what does U dagger physically correspond to, or what does it correspond to in this diagram? It corresponds to reading the diagram from right to left. So if we initialize qubit 1 and qubit 2 on the right, and we follow them along going from right to left, that is what this U dagger is telling us. So U dagger is the reverse. We're playing back what would have happened. And that is one of the consequences of being unitary. So this operator is unitary by definition, because these guys are inverses of each other. If we were to multiply U uh, by U dagger, or U dagger by U, we would get the identity operator. But it would not be the same identity operator that we have here. This is a two by two matrix in its matrix representation. The identity operator that you would get by multiplying these guys would be a four by four identity matrix. So that would be the tensor product of I with I. So if you just have two qubits and you consider this part before the Hadamard and this part over here, this would be identity, tensor product, identity. You're not doing anything to the qubits yet. So that is a diagonal matrix with four ones along the diagonal. So that would be the result of multiplying these two matrices together. And you can construct that by taking the tensor product of identity in the qubit 1 subspace and identity in the qubit 2 subspace. Now, let's have a look at the matrix representations of these operators. So take this equation over here and use the two qubit computational basis to construct these matrices over here. So this is in the two qubit computational basis. We always have to choose a particular basis when we're constructing matrix representations. So this is the controlled knot. This is the tensor product of the Hadamard with the identity. And this is the result of matrix multiplication. If we, take them, if we do matrix multiplication on these 4x4 four four matrices, we will end up with this 4x4 four four resultant matrix. We can also write this in a slightly different way. We can identify that this 4x4 four four matrix can also be condensedly written as four separate 2x2 two two matrices. So it's exactly the same matrix, but we're just writing it in a more condensed notation. Over here, we can identify the identity uh, for a 2x2 two two system. So this is a 2x2 two two matrix, and we'll just write capital I. And over here, we can see Pauli X. And 
O or 0 sub, uh, sub 2 and 0 sub 2, they are 2 by 2 matrices consisting only of 0 entries. So we have four zeros in this 2 by 2 matrix. And that is condensed notation over here. What about this matrix over here? As aside from this normalization factor of 1 on square root of 2, we can identify that we have the identity uh, appearing in these three quadrants. And in this quadrant, we have minus the identity. So that can be condensedly written in this form. And when we perform the matrix multiplication, we can identify that we have the identity operator, the identity operator, then we have Pali x and minus Pali x. So that is written over here. So that is what u is. u is the result of taking this matrix product, and this gives you the resultant matrix. What about u dagger? Well, u dagger is exactly the same as swapping the order of these guys around. So this comes over here, that's the controlled knot, and the tensor product of the Hadamard with the identity, that gets moved over here. And if we were to evaluate this, we would actually get the transpose of this matrix. It is actually not just the transpose, it is the Hermitian adjoint. But because all of the values in this matrix are real numbers, the complex conjugate part of performing the Hermitian adjoint has no effect. So the complex conjugate doesn't change this matrix, but taking the transpose does. It takes this identity and this Pali X and it swaps them around. And these minus ones also get swapped around on the diagonal. But because this minus one and this minus one are equal to each other, swapping them around doesn't make a difference. So this, there's no difference over here. This does not make a difference. But these guys, they do make a difference because you can see ones over here in a different combination to the ones over here. So we can write that over here as I, I appearing on this, this first, first column, and then we have X minus X appearing over here. And just by examining this matrix, you can see that it is the transpose. And that is what we've got for U and U dagger. Now, uh, one thing that I really want to stress on is that we have to be very care careful when we're taking the tensor products. So this over here, that we're, the matrix that we're dealing with is the Hadamard tensor product with the identity. Let's have a look at some other similar uh, combinations that we might potentially confuse with when we're writing out these matrix multiplications or these tensor products. So this is the case that we're dealing with. We have the Hadamard applied to qubit 1 and qubit 2 gets left alone. So when the qubit gets left alone, that's just the identity. We take Hadamard tensor product with the identity. And this is the matrix written in condensed notation. This is exactly the same matrix that we've encountered up here. But what about the other cases? What if we left qubit 1 alone and we acted uh, on qubit 2 with the Hadamard gate? Well, that would be the identity tensor product with the Hadamard gate. So we have the opposite order over here. We've swapped these guys around. And what does that actually mean? That means that we have a completely different matrix that we're dealing with over here. We have the Hadamard appearing as a block diagonal matrix. And then we just have a block of zeros and a block of zeros over here. Those are two by two blocks of zeros. So this matrix and this matrix are not equal to each other. You have to be very careful with the order. And the order physically also means something different. The order tells you that you're applying on qubit 2 over here, whereas you're applying on qubit 1 over here. So it's physically different, and it's also uh, different in its matrix representation. What would happen if we applied the Hadamard gate to both of the qubits? So qubit 1 and qubit 2 get acted on by the Hadamard gate. Well, we would take the tensor product of the Hadamard with the Hadamard. And that would give this combination over here. You would have the Hadamard appearing with a plus sign in these three places, and you also have minus h appearing over here. Implicitly, inside this h, there is a normalization factor of 1 on square root of 2. And you could factor that out but when you write this out as a 4 by 4 matrix. And you could combine that with this 1 on square root of 2, and that will give you 1 half. But over here, we also have an implicit 1 on square root of 2. Inside both of these h's, all of the terms are multiplied by 1 on square root of 2. So we can actually factor that 1 on square root of 2 outside if we write this as a 4 by 4 matrix. Over here, the 1 on square root of 2 is written explicitly. And all of these identities, they don't have any extra normalization factors. So this is just a, a, a little side note which helps us distinguish uh, other possible cases uh, if we apply different combinations of the Hadamard on qubit 1 or on qubit 2. So it's important to play around with the tensor product to get an intuitive feel as to what it is actually doing and what kind of matrix representations you're constructing when you combine 2 by 2 matrices to form a 4 by 4 matrix.
So it's very informative to see the patterns that emerge. Now, let's have a look at what happens if we apply this unitary, this resultant matrix over here, on the computational basis states. We have four computational basis states because we have a four-dimensional Hilbert space for our two-qubit system. We have the states 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So let's imagine we prepare qubit 1 and qubit 2 in these computational basis states. If we prepare them both in the 0 state, then we're going to have 0 tensor product 0. And that is actually what this means. This means 0 tensor product 0. And there's another video in the quantum mechanics playlist where I go into the specific details of matrix multiplication on how we can construct the matrix representations of this particular state and all of these computational basis states. So if we, for, for a moment, consider just that case where we have zero tensor product zero, what is going to happen? Well, we can read off the entries of this resultant matrix over here. And this tells us that the zero zero entry and the one one entry will be used to create a superposition. So this first column corresponds to where this state is going to get mapped to. So we're going to take 0, 0, and we're going to map it to a linear combination of 0, 0 and 1, 1. And there is a normalization factor of 1 on square root of 2. So this combination we can call phi plus. That is one of the Bell states. What if we wanted to prepare these other states over here? Well, if we're starting with 0, 0, we can introduce a bit flip. And we can use a Pali X matrix to act on one of the states to introduce a bit flip. If we wanted to produce the 0, 1 state, we would need a bit flip on the second qubit. So we could put a Pali X matrix over here, and that would change the 0 to a 1. What if we wanted to produce this one over here? Instead of putting the Pali X on qubit 2, we could put the Pali X on qubit 1 before the Hadamard. So we take that 0 and we turn it to a 1, and then we put that into the Hadamard gate. And what about this last one over here? Well, we have a 1 and a 1, so we'd have to flip both of the zeros. So if we're starting with 0, 0, then we would have to put a poly x and a poly x over here. And the matrix representation of that would be poly x tensor product with poly x. So we have poly x acting on both of the states. And if we initialize them at 0, then that would turn them both into 1. So we would get the 1, 1 state. Let's see where these other states get mapped to by examining the other columns of this matrix. So if we look at the 0, 1 column, we have to take a linear combination of the 0, 1 state and the 1, 0 state. So 0, 1 plus 1, 0. And of course, we have the normalization factor. We can call this psi plus. So here we have phi plus and psi plus. These are both Greek letters, phi and psi. Now let's have a look at the remaining two states. If we look at the 1, 0 column, this corresponds to a copy of 0, 0, and then minus 1, 1. So we have 0, 0, minus 1, 1. There is a minus sign over here. So we've got the opposite phase to what we have in this state. And we can call this the phi minus. So the phi minus is very similar to phi plus. The only difference is a relative uh, phase between these two states in this superposition. Now, let's have a look at 1, 1. 1, 1 is this last column, and we get this linear combination of 0, 1 minus 1, 0. So again, there is a minus sign over here. There is a relative phase between these guys that is different from what we have up here. And we can call this psi minus. Collectively, these states are known as the Bell basis, and they are Bell states. So Bell states form the Bell basis. Over here we have the Bell basis, and over here we have the two-qubit computational basis. This matrix, which is a, a matrix representation of this unitary, which is also a representation of this quantum circuit, maps the computational basis states to the Bell basis. And it actually preserves that property of orthonormality. So all of these guys are, form an orthonormal basis. If you take the inner product of any of these guys with a different Bell state, you will get zero. But if you take the inner product of any of these states with itself, you will get one. Why will you get one? Well, it's because of this normalization coefficient. If we uh, distribute this normalization coefficient to both terms, and then we take the inner product, 
we would have to take the square of this term plus the square of the other coefficient. And the square of 1 on square root of 2 is 1 half. So then we would add 1 half plus 1 half, and that would give us 1. You can see why it's so useful to have this normalization coefficient. It stops us from having to keep putting these extra constants in equations later. So in the definition of the Hadamard, we actually saw this 1 on square root of 2. So it is a very useful normalization coefficient, and that helps us preserve normalization. So what if we want to go from the Bell states back to the computational basis states? Well, instead of applying this, we would apply the Hermitian adjoint, which is the inverse. So we would apply this matrix, U dagger. If we apply U dagger to these states, then we will go back to the computational basis states. What does that look like in the diagram? That's the same as reversing directions and going from right to left. So we could prepare qubit 1 and qubit 2 in a Bell state. And then we could take that Bell state and allow it to travel from right to left in this circuit, and we would get one of the computational basis states. And if we measure the system in this basis, we will get one of these options. And we will be able to infer what Bell state must have been here at the beginning in order to, for us to measure one of these states over here. So that is a, a very amazing property. And this basis, the Bell basis, has so many incredible properties. The property of entanglement is essential in understanding this basis. And we will see why this is uh, of such a, a useful basis in quantum information. These Bell states are an orthonormal basis that can allow us to examine two qubit systems from a different perspective. So we can still describe the same time evolution, but in a different basis. What makes these states so special is that you cannot factor them into qubit 1, tensor product qubit 2. So you cannot factor them into the subspaces of qubit 1 and qubit 2. There is no way you can write them in a, a simpler form. That is actually known as entanglement. And there's different ways that we can describe entanglement, and we'll go into the details in later videos in the quantum mechanics playlist. But the takeaway message from this video is that you can use a quantum circuit consisting of a Hadamard gate and a controlled NOT gate to map the computational basis states for a two-qubit system to the Bell states. And you can use that to construct the Bell basis, which is another type of orthonormal basis for a two-qubit system, where all of this is living in a four-dimensional Hilbert space. You can find all the other videos in the quantum mechanics playlist where we keep talking about these Bell states if you click over here.